I'm Eric Lev, of course, um, and I'm over at the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater. And uh, we collaborated to put this event together about uh, fake news in the media, something I'm sure you've all heard a lot about, and uh, something that's been a big topic in the media and politics course that I'm currently teaching that ends in about 10 hours. So <laughs> when the clock strikes midnight, um, I put the grades in and we're done. So um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to uh, today go through a little bit of kind of the basic idea of what is and I, I think also what isn't fake news is an important thing. Um, there's a great uh, typology kind of a way of thinking about uh, fake news that we'll go through as well and then uh, I want to share a little bit some of the consequences and maybe some of the things we might do about it. Uh, so with that I thought I would actually start with um, the potential for fake news to, to do good things or at least entertaining things. Uh, some of you might remember uh, in the, uh, not the most recent Star Wars, but they uh, had a, a, the Rogue One film, which came out a few years ago, they needed to recreate a character from the original run who's not around. Um, and they managed to do this using the same technology that can be used for uh, not so good things in a political world. So um, I always want to uh, acknowledge that this is ultimately a, a double-edged sword kind of issue. We often think of uh, you know, anything in media and politics is just kind of everyone's corrupt or everyone's evil. Um, but I think it's really important to remember that all of the negative also has some potential positive and, and kind of vice versa. So uh, my goal when I talk about this sort of thing is to just try and get us all thinking about uh, how do we kind of exploit one while minimizing the other. Because even though technology can do good things, it can also maybe do some not so good things. So this is an example where um, essentially a, a fake tweet, a fake image was made uh, where it was implied that the Antifa, people from kind of the, the far anti-fascist group and left, were um, physically assaulting individuals who were aligning with right movements or with Donald Trump, that kind of thing. And um, so this went out and then you have people on the political right thinking that this actually happened, that there were people going out and assaulting others for their political views. And if you look at some of the comments and sorts of things like that, uh, may or may not be legible on your end, but you can imagine what people would think if that was in fact a legitimate um, picture. So uh, really, uh, like I said, very much a double-edged sword. And so I wanna kind of approach this from a number of angles. Uh, and just to, to revisit what I mentioned kind of qualitatively before, uh, mm -hmm. a little bit of the background, um, a little bit of the threat, uh, a little bit of what I argue is the inevitability of fake news. We often talk about it like something, like it is something that can be cured. Um, it's kind of inevitable. Um, and part of that, quite frankly, is on you and me. Um, one thing we'll talk about is, is humans are not good at being objective. We're really good at thinking we can be objective. We're really bad at being objective. Um, so uh, part of it is certainly on the politics and the press and the government, but some of it's us too. Uh, so we'll talk about that. And then uh, I wanna share with you some of the uh, ideas that I've seen and kind of organized into uh, big things for us to be keeping in mind when it comes to how do we combat this? And there are any number of resources online and lists and things like that of all these tips and things. It's pretty chaotic when you put it all together. So I've tried to organize it into some categories here that might help us make some sense of it. And I'm happy to refer you uh, to all that other stuff too, if it would be helpful. So um, with that, I think it's really important at the start to mention that fake news is not new. Uh, we certainly associate it um, and a certain brand of it with, with Donald Trump and how big was the inauguration crowd and all that stuff. Right. But if we think about you know, the concept of sensationalism and kind of manipulating things, maybe putting together headlines that are not quite accurate, that's been around as long as this country has been. If you look at the newspapers from the founding period, on one page, James Madison is articulating a vision for this constitution they're thinking about. And on the next, you might see some really sensationalist story about what you know, some bartender is doing in Boston or something like that. And actually, some of the you know, biggest names in media, like Joseph Pulitzer, who we associate with the prize that is associated with good media, good journalism. Um, he was one of the pioneers of, of yellow journalism, in fact. And if you go back to our history, uh, especially kind of in the, the turn of the century, um, things like the Spanish-American War, the assassination of President McKinley, um, a number of people have made cases that the way the media covered these stories and talked about things like uh, the attack on a U.S. ship in the harbor of Havana, Cuba, uh, actually led us into some of these events. And again, 
may or may not be a bit of a stretch, but uh, potentially, you know, assassins, <laughs> presidential assassins being moved by fake news. So, uh, you know, I think the term fake news has taken on a new meaning, and I, I won't, I'll certainly concede that point. Uh, but I think it's also important to know that, again, this is not a new thing. We have throughout history seen some pretty big examples of, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, it's politics or entertainment, um, but we see what happens when uh, people are not necessarily, you know, tracking with, you know, true objective reality, which of course some people would um, even question what that looks like. So uh, I think that's a, an important premise, is that this is not a phenomena unique to Donald Trump or unique to millennials or anything like that. Although again, it sure certainly has taken on you know, a, new, uh, a new form. So with, with that, uh, I wanted to also, before we get into that typology, uh, talk briefly about what is fake news? Because I imagine if we all wrote down a definition, we might have some similar themes but probably have some, some pretty, pretty different ideas about exactly what it means. I'm not going to pretend to be the final authority on this. Um, the only advantage I bring is I've read a lot about it and, and seen how a lot of other people have formulated it, and I put it together in a way that I think is, is helpful. So this is the definition that, that I borrow from. It's tweaked, it, it, it relies on a few different conceptualizations and ideas from, from others. So again, I wanna make sure to, to give credit to the wider world of people who are looking into this stuff. But the way I look at fake news is that it's mass distributed content that deliberately disinforms with the intent to gain politically or financially. So uh, you know, a couple important things to look at, the idea of mass distribution, uh, the idea of deliberate disinformation, um, looking to gain, that kind of thing. And it can take on many forms, which we'll look at. Uh, you know, exaggeration, you could argue, is a form of fake news. Uh, you know, selective omission, deciding not to talk about something, leaving out a little detail, you could argue that's fake news, even if the rest is true, right? Um, it could be the generation of just patently false information, right? Which, of course, we've, we've heard a lot about in politics the last couple of years. These all kind of fall into that category. And so I thought it would be helpful in, in a few minutes to think about how can we organize this in some way, because not all fake news is the same. Kind of in that same spirit, I thought it would be helpful to think a little bit about what fake news is not. Again, it's a very broad term, broad definition, but I think there are a couple things we ought to rule out when it comes to trying to make sense of it. Uh, number one, which is again somewhat unique to, to the Trump administration, or at least to modern politics, is the idea of fake news being what I, I don't like, right? Um, just like, you know, hate speech is technically legal, but a lot of people say my hate speech, right? what I think is hate speech, should not be legal. Uh, same kind of thing here. We, we've heard people level the charge of fake news um, at situations or evolutions that are not necessarily untrue, but are in fact disconcerting. So again, I do not want to say this is limited to Donald Trump. I'm trying to bring in examples from the left and the right. That's, that's tr how I try to do things more generally. But this is certainly something that has come up recently as a phenomenon um, that is, again, not necessarily unique to Donald Trump, but certainly more prominent than we've associated with, say, the, the few, last few presidents before him. So we've often heard this term fake news thrown around when something that people in power don't like has happened. And I would argue that that doesn't meet our definition of fake news. It, it just meets their definition of a bad day, basically. The other one, and this one I might get some pushback on, I occasionally do from students, but um, again, in the course of trying to organize this, I will argue that fake news is not negligence. That if there are in fact legitimate errors, legitimate mistakes that journalists make, we should not classify that as fake news. Um, again, we talk about fake news, that, that term deliberate I think is really important because it is very common in any industry for you know political scientists we all said there's no way donald trump will win you may recall um, we all make mistakes and so i think it's important to clarify the the genuine errors that come with being a journalist today uh, they're no more or less human than the rest of us uh, but i often see people lumping in anything that is inaccurate as as fake and i don't think that's probably the best way to think about it because sometimes they just make mistakes um, and sometimes they're really bad mistakes. Um, whether or not it rises to fake news is somewhat uh, up for debate. But I would say if it's a true mistake, we probably shouldn't classify it that way. 
so uh, with 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 that in mind um, we can start thinking about how we organize it but I will offer one one kind of caveat if you will which is uh, things don't fall into those categories very easily in many cases uh, one that jumped out to me uh, recently was uh, does anyone here remember right I don't I forget if it was right after the election or after the inauguration but uh, Donald Trump claimed that a car factory in where was it Kentucky uh, had been planning to move to Mexico but he worked with Ford and now it's going to stay that was a, a big story for a couple weeks I uh, I think it was after the uh, the election because uh, I'm pretty sure it wasn't in power yet but regardless what was interesting about this story was it was kind of a little bit true in the sense that maybe Donald Trump president-elect Trump did work with Bill Ford and maybe they reached an agreement um, but to go out and say that the factory was going to shutter and everything moved to Mexico was not really accurate either because mm -hmm. it turned out that only one line of cars was moving and they had been planning to move something back in and it maybe wasn't going to be as big a deal as everything shutting down and you can see how quickly these sorts of stories get complicated for people who are just watching the crawler at the bottom of the screen or seeing a brief paragraph in the USA Today so a lot of these details can get lost and I again will concede that things do not fall cleanly into all the categories that we'll talk about but I, I again I think it's hopefully helpful to to think of it that way one other note before we get into the typology is uh, I don't think this is unique to politics. We, we talk about fake news in a political context principally. It's certainly an issue, um, but it's, it's not limited to politics. And, and actually things like uh, fake news in medical journals or the potential exaggeration of results, uh, things like that have long been an issue in many sectors of, of society. So we'll certainly focus on politics because that's the most relevant for a lot of us, certainly in my world. Um, but I do think it's important to acknowledge uh, that it's not a narrow band of society. This is, uh, I think, more broad, and we'll talk about why that is in a few, in a few minutes. So uh, with that, I want to give a shout out to Claire Wardle. She works at firstdraftnews.com, and she originally put together this typology that I'd like to share and elaborate on. Uh, they did wonderful work over there, and the basic thinking behind it was dichotomizing, turning fake news into a yes or no, is not terribly helpful and that we should instead think of it in terms of how deceptive was the story. In other words, what, how severe was the intent to deceive? And there may be very, very mild attempts or very, very severe attempts, and those, she argues, rightfully, I think, ought to be considered you know, different levels of significance, different levels of, of fake news. So uh, I think it's a really awesome take-home point bumper sticker for us. Yes, sir. Could I break in and Please. say there's a couple of levels, and I'd like you to address these levels. One is like the, uh, the, the Gulf of Tonkin incident was false. Uh, it wasn't created by the news services themselves. It was handed to them by the government. Right. And so there are placed false news stories and, uh, in which the news media was not intentionally deceptive, and then there are placed stories in which the news distribution network is, in fact, right. uh, giving disinformation. Right, absolutely. One thing that we talk about in my media course is the, the what's called the mirror image model of, of media, which is the idea that the media's job is to be a mirror to what's going on in the world. Uh, now that model doesn't hold up terribly well and it especially can be problematic in a foreign policy context like you're talking about because the media weren't there, right? It's not like a 9-11 or unemployment numbers in the States. Um, one thing, it's so funny, we were talking about this just the other day in my class. Uh, in some domains, particularly foreign policy, uh, the media has have to rely a lot more on the government and Gulf of Tonkin is a great example. Embedding reporters in Iraq in the first Gulf War and the second is another. And the you know selective sharing of information or selective access. So uh, that that's a really good point in the sense of uh, you know again thinking about how complicit is the media in that kind of thing. I would argue there's some, but they also very much rely on information that other, that others provide too. And if that's false, then they're just kind of the middle person, right? So I'm I'm totally with you. Uh, I I think we'll address some of that, but if we don't, let's come back to it. Absolutely, I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. 
came in a little late. Did you want us to hold a question? You know, I, I was so excited to get going <laughs> that I failed to share with you my summer policy, which is let's just have a conversation. I think we're a small enough group to do that. So please, anytime. Okay. I should have said that. I apologize. Well, then I was thinking if you're talking about um, intended deception, yeah. what about intended bias when most of the media, as far as we know, were <coughs> contributors to one political party? Mm -hmm. And then wouldn't their natural bias for their candidate influence the way they were reporting? For example, what about Tom Brokaw? Remember that oh, yeah. incident with uh, one of the Bushes? On a helicopter, yeah. 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 And, and yet he was praised after lying about Bush's military service, praised by the organization, uh, the, the journalistic organization. So he had his own bias. He knew it was false, went with it, wasn't pub, uh, punished at all for the deception. And then, like right. I said before, would you comment on when most of reporters tend to be on one side or the other, how do you how do you try at all to maintain some integrity? Right. Uh, gosh, that's that's a whole separate talk. I, have to, okay. I can get on my laptop and look at my slides <laughs> and see what else I have on that. Um, as far as the bias issue, I mean that's that's obviously very much related to this. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't put a lot in here directly on it because we already have many slides. Um, what I will what I will share based on on what I know, and I try to let kind of the evidence drive what I share and not my opinions as, as much as possible. Um, we do know the industry of journalism tends to lean to the left. Um, one of my favorite extra credit questions on my uh, exam is, when was the last time the New York Times endorsed a Republican for president? <laughs> there you go. It was Eisenhower in 1956. Yeah. Uh, so as an institution, it, it's populated more by people left of center than right of center. Uh, higher ed is the same thing, right? Professors tend to be. Yeah. Um, so uh, the reason I draw that analogy is because uh, I find that while that is true, uh, I think it's important to separate that from the nature of, of the work they do. And by that I mean, uh, you know, the broke cause of the world notwithstanding and, and, and some of the mistakes or, or intentional um, misjudgments, as you say, uh, those notwithstanding, I, I, it is certainly possible for journalists or professors or bankers or whoever uh, to do a good job to, to set those aside. Obviously, we can debate the degree to which they're successful in doing so, because uh, I, I certainly see it permeating in from time to time, as, as you're suggesting. Um, but if you don't oh, think please. they can slant it on their own, then is it the next level that is giving the news that they want put out for that day? Right. That they are picking and choosing what we hear as right that is the top news. and you actually just jumped right to where i was going to go okay. which is uh no you're you are you are spot on um so when we talk about bias often the ideological bias is what comes up mm -hmm. um but there's another kind of bias that comes before any of that which is uh it, it's the agenda setting bias which is nightly news taking out commercials is 22 minutes long do you really think there are only 22 minutes of worthwhile things that happen in the country in a given day um and people have to choose what stories which ones go first, how long they get, uh, that is a form of bias that is literally unavoidable, right? Like journalists can try to say, oh, we'll bring in stuff from the West Coast or the East Coast or left and right, uh, but it is, like you say, literally impossible for them not to pick a set of things to talk about. Um, and even that, you could argue, is a form of bias. For instance, if the president had a really bad week and they were simply covering what happened in Washington that week, even if they were completely truthful, even if they were a perfect mirror image, it would still make the president look bad, whichever party that person happened to be. So, um, you know, I, I certainly can't speak for every journalist, and uh, it, it again is certainly plausible that some of them will let those things seep in. Um, but you think but, too, it's the next level up that is actually being the most determinant. Yeah, in, in, in yeah, effect. and and the best evidence that we have suggests that the the biggest form of bias in the media is not purely ideological. Um, it's sensational, which is to say, if what it, sells. it what sells, right? If it leads, it leads. Um, there was a uh, a show called The Newsroom on HBO. Aaron Sorkin, if any of you know The West Wing, uh, he did this show. Um, and one of the things they explored in that show, the show was set in a news studio. And one of the things that came up was the anchor didn't want to talk about the Casey Anthony trial. Do you remember that a few years ago? It was all over the news, and the journalist was saying there are other things to talk about. And the producers were saying, no, 
people are watching Casey Anthony. Like that's what you, you gotta stay with it. I don't care if you don't like it. Uh, so there, there's definitely that pressure. Um, and we can certainly come back to this. I'll make one, one other comment on it now, which is the, the other challenge for us is that the distinction between commentary and pure journalism is going away. So you take someone like Chris Matthews, Rachel Maddow, Sean Hannity, Tucker Carlson, uh, they're openly liberal conservative, uh, which I actually think is not at all a problem if they're open about it and they're not purporting to be giving you the news. If they're purporting to say, here's what's going on in the world, here's my take on it, here's why Donald Trump is terrible, here's why Donald Trump is awesome, I actually have no problem with that. But too often those things kind of merge a little bit and it gets really hard to see where one starts and one ends. So in that sense, I, I absolutely agree um, that there's a challenge. Um, but as far as should we be concerned that the propensity for the, the industry of journalism, so to speak, um, to be more left than right, is that inherently going to lead to uh, you know, fundamentally biased coverage of, of everything? Um, I, you know, without being too idealistic, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. I think there are a lot of other forces that, that come into play as well. Um, but the example you bring up, I mean, you know, we still talk about the Tom Brokaw incident, well, partly because it was such a letdown. So, Are we talking mostly print journalism? <clears throat> are you talking mostly um, the television, or yeah. are you mingling? The oh, well, so everything kind of goes together. Okay. I, I would argue that, generally speaking, print is going to have fewer issues than other forms, partly because the process of publishing and reviewing and typesetting and all that gives you far more opportunity to double check, right? And, and if you're out there tweeting, you know, what the president just said or, or what helicopter just landed or whatnot, um, that's unfiltered, it's unreviewed by senior editors and things like that. So um, doesn't mean print can't do it, but one thing I'll talk about in a little bit is the propensity for technology to accelerate some of these negative things that we're talking about. Um, but I, I very much appreciate and agree with the challenge you're laying out. I just think there are a lot of things that make it hard for us to set a, a single rule, but you hit on several things that are absolutely applicable. So let's let's keep talking about this as we as we go on, because I totally agree. Um, so uh, getting back to our model here, we have, that was a great setup for this. Um, again, this is not the be all end all. This is, I think, a pretty good way of thinking about it. There are certainly others that people might propose, um, but Claire Worrell's model basically says, think about fake news in terms of how deceptive is it trying to be? And she argues there's really seven different levels. Again, we can argue, some people might say there's eight or five, you know, we'll just run with these for now because there's a nice little infographic to share with you at the end. Um, but basically she just says, think about this content in terms of how much it's intending to deceive. And so what I'll do is I'll talk briefly about these, maybe give an example or two, because uh, I don't want this to get too academic, but just to give you a sense of what we're talking about. So if we think of fake news that is more on the less deceptive, more fun, more satire end, what we mean by that is content that is not trying to harm, but it could potentially fool or spread some things that are not entirely true. So a really good example of this, if you go back to 2016, was all the late night television shows that were doing, you know, Alec Baldwin as Donald Trump and, um, uh, you know, the several appearances um, by the presidential candidates on late night shows and things like that, various parodies and all that, um, which by the way, are not new. Right? Again, not entirely a new phenomenon. Um, but these could qualify as fake news in, in the purest sense of the word, right? They're, they're not pushing out the most accurate information. They're exaggerating features and mannerisms and such, but not necessarily of any severe harm to people who are paying attention. So satire parody, you know, probably more if you're an informed viewer, not going to be an issue. Um, but when we get more deceptive, we can see different types of things that the media may do. Um, this one I see a lot, uh, what Wardle calls the false connection form of fake news, where a headline or a caption or a picture is inconsistent with the basic substance of the story. Now, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I remember at one point seeing data uh, concerning what percentage of people read beyond the headline, and it's shockingly low. Right, so I remember when I was in journalism class in high school, we talked about how important the headline is because for most people, that's all they'll read. Um, so if you're trying to get someone to read your story, you see the perverse incentive, right? Um, and so sometimes you'll see a headline like this. It's from a few years ago. Air pollution, now leading cause of lung cancer. Right? Uh, now on the surface, that sounds like they are saying the leading cause of lung cancer is now air pollution. Um, but what they're really 
saying if you were to argue with them legally is they would say well this is an abbreviated headline and what we really mean is air pollution is a leading cause of cancer right um, so if you actually read this story there's our headline again you look at some of the doctors that they uh, asked for opinions on this uh, we now know that outdoor air pollution is not only a major risk to health in general but is also a leading environmental cause of cancer deaths another doctor said although you know increases um, can increase your your uh, potential for lung cancer by quote a small amount other things have a much bigger effect on our risk particularly smoking so um, again not that there's no fake numbers these are real quotes and all that stuff but we're very much seeing a headline that is not jiving with the real true sense of the story and you know again if you think about it a, a headline saying you know there is a link between pollution and a small increase in the chance of cancer that's certainly not as attractive to a reader as leading cause yes ma'am I, I was just going to say the sentence under that headline air pollution has been named as yep. the, the leading, leading cause. cause yep so uh i don't know if i would draw from you know i'd read the top thing and think well maybe they lucked out the word uh Right. If I read the next thing, I'll think, well, then it must be the yeah. leading cause of lung cancer. See, I wasn't so going to condemn them that much, but you, you've you you've called them out, yeah. Because um, well, that, that's even more explicitly linking what... what the tobacco industry things, though. <laughs> sure. Um, so, uh, at any rate, yeah, really, really good example. Um, and, again, something that I really encourage people to, uh, you know, just take note of the propensity for this to happen. Because living in a, a, a society with a largely privatized media system, you know, that means that, you know, the media have an incentive to get as many eyeballs as they can. And this is one way they can potentially do that. Yes, sir. Do you recall where that story appeared? That headline is from... You know what? Let me see. I, off the top of my head, I don't. I mean, I can certainly find it for you. I have it in my notes. Um, I just didn't put it in the presentation. Um, and incidentally, by the way, I'm happy to give business cards and email any of this stuff to people. Because um, one thing I'll argue is that transparency is a really important way to help combat this. So happy to share it. Um, all right. So we got the first two. Um, Moving on towards more deception, um, misleading content. This one I think is a little bit fuzzy. Um, I might personally combine it with one of the other categories, but again, we will work with this great model. Um, misleading content is when information is used to frame um, an, uh, an issue or an individual in, again, just a, a misleading way. And I think a good example of this came right at Christmas time last year, uh, which I don't know if anyone saw because who's watching the news right around right around then it's a nice break for all of us um, but there's a story that came out in Newsweek <clears throat> excuse me headline Melania Trump orders the removal of a near 200 year old tree from the White House right uh, which you might read that as saying Melania doesn't like her view so she's going to tear down the tree that Andrew Jackson planted right that's what some of the comments were like and that kind of thing uh, again though it, it's misleading because yes there was a tr there's a 200 year old tree that came down um, and yes, maybe the First Lady's office had something to do with organizing the paperwork, but uh, what actually happened was, you know, there were tree experts and people saying this tree is dying, like it's leaning against power lines, it, it's not a healthy tree, it needs to come down, it's lived its life. Um, so if you were to go to the, the right-leaning media in the world, you saw all sorts of headlines like this, and they're lambasting the original article as failing to give us all of what we needed to make you know to have a comment and a thought on what's going on here because when you put it all together i don't know how interesting of a story like to say oh bummer we lost a 200 year old tree um that's probably kind of interesting um i would also be interested in knowing how did they get the tree to live 200 years like that would be a pretty cool story as well so the the misleading idea um, i think often incorporates things like uh you know a lack of Full information and maybe leaving out details that make that headline a little bit more attractive again trying to get the clicks trying to get the eyeballs as we get to false context we're getting more and more to the heavy end of deception um, false context is when you take real stuff that happened but you put it in a false context you use it in a way it was not originally intended even though it's very much real the words the quotes the images that kind of thing um, so uh, here's an interesting one. You may remember there were a few special elections after Donald Trump was elected because members of Congress took positions in his administration. There's a big one in Georgia to replace the seat there. And a lot of people were saying, this is gonna be our first 
you know, assessment of how the world is going to look, you know, are Democrats going to find a way to fight back and all that <laughs> stuff. So a lot of attention went into this race. And there was an ad there, and, and they ran it uh, with a, a voiceover of a woman who said this. She said, hi, my name is Audrey Pruitt, a fellow black American working very hard every day, just like you. It may seem out of season, but all of a sudden, Democratic politicians have started coming around again. We normally only see them every other November, swarming around and making promises to get our vote, but nothing ever changes for us, does it? Here's what President Barack Obama had to say about it. So we have a, a woman of color basically saying, Democrats just want your vote, and then they're going to ignore you for two years. Right? Um, and then they turn, and Barack Obama comes in and has something to say, which I would stop and listen to that, too, in this context. Um, so they used a quote from Barack Obama's book, and the quote included this phrase, plantation politics, black people in the worst jobs, the worst housing, police brutality rampant, but when the so-called black committee men came around election time, we'd all line up and vote the straight democratic ticket, sell our souls for a Christmas turkey. Now this quote sounds like it's supporting that voiceover we just heard, that it's consistent. And, they, and we have Barack Obama, this was from the audiobook, so he's actually saying it. Uh, here's the thing though, he didn't say it in that context. What he was actually doing was quoting somebody who was speaking about the first African-American mayor in Chicago many you know, decades before. So you have a real quote, you have Barack Obama saying it, like he did read that into a microphone. But if you look at the, the context where it was coming from, it has nothing to do with how responsive is the Democratic Party to black voters in Georgia. Right? So um, again, we're not at the point where the content is fake, we're getting close. Um, but we're taking real stuff, real quotes, real commentary, and it's being used in a way that it was never intended. And this one, we hear a lot of politicians complain about being taken out of context. You know, you only used 12 seconds of my 30 minute speech, that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, again, getting more and more to the deceptive end. The next one, imposter content was kind of interesting. And I actually had not really thought about this prior to studying up on this model. Um, but they argue that there is a type of fake media that comes when you have real people who are impersonated, have things attributed to them that are not real. Uh, a, a big example from, from this, I don't know if any of you might happen to recall, back in 2004, Fox News ran a story um, in which uh, John Kerry uh, ostensibly said things like, didn't my nails look great? Um, women should like me, I do manicures. Uh, I'm metrosexual, he's a cowboy, referring to George W. Bush. Um, and so this story went out, and this never happened, of course. And uh, so Fox News retracted it, and to their credit, apologized. In a story I was reading about the New York Times covering how did this happen, uh, their report from Fox, the, the Fox folks said it was just kind of a gag, it was never meant to go out, it was just kind of an in-house joke or something like that. Um, so again, if, if that's valid, then maybe this doesn't fall into fake news and it falls into mistake. Uh, obviously, some people probably don't believe that interpretation. I will leave it to you to decide. Uh, again, happy to provide you all the original documents if it would help. But either way, when you have real people having things that they did not do or say attributed to them, we're getting to the point of some pretty serious uh, deception. Um, I had a yes, please. comment about the imposter content, yeah. which is I recently read about a way that um, videos can be digitally manipulated to make it look like somebody is saying something they never said. And that seems to me really hard to be certain about. Did, did like you hack into watching my computer like or something? <laughs> I have, I, I, we are gonna talk about okay. the exact thing. That was awesome, yeah. Um, one of the things we're gonna talk about is like, technology makes it easier for all this stuff to happen. But you are exactly right, you're, just, you're totally reading my mind. This is a really great, really intelligent group. Um, so uh, yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Um, so our, our penultimate level of fake news, manipulated content, this one I'm sure you've all seen too. This is when you have real information, real pictures, real quotes, but they're changed or manipulated in some way to make people look bad. So a classic one uh, is a doctored photograph, for instance. Um, I, I imagine most of you have seen, maybe not this picture, but maybe this picture or somebody digitally moved the cord to make it look like George Bush was holding the phone upside down. You might remember that. Uh, there are some with Barack Obama doing the same thing. There are these technology people are on all sides. Um, here's another one. Osama bin Laden meeting with Hillary Clinton. Um, now if you look closely, the proportions aren't exactly right. Uh, 
Um, but again, think about a world where most people are consuming things by scrolling through phones um, or just there's a crawler. Um, and the other thing too is even if you sent out a correction and you apologized, what percentage of the people that saw the fake news do you think got the apology two days later, right? So it gets really, really complicated. But um, yeah, we're getting now to the really, really overt forms um, that even gets beyond some of the things that we accuse politicians of today, because this is usually done, you know, not necessarily by people in power, but by you know voters or you know activist groups and things like that. But there's actually one more that is arguably even more deceptive, and this one we do sometimes associate with with politicians, and that is straight up fabricated content, right? Everything so far has had some level of of genuine to it, right? And it might be manipulated or taken out of context, but the words happened, the pictures are real, all that kind of thing. Here we're talking about some people just saying, I'm gonna throw it out there, see what happens, right? Um, and uh, just false stuff, it's that simple. Um, now again, I do not want to, uh, you know, attack or, or you know, be one-sided or anything like that, but this is something that we have seen a lot the last couple of years. Um, when it comes to the Trump administration, starting with on the very first day. Um, you might remember that discussion about um, how big was the crowd at the inauguration. Um, and the press secretary at the time, Sean Spicer, introduced that glorious term, alternative facts. Yes. Some of you might remember that. Um, I think now, it was actually Kellyanne Conway. Yeah. Oh, was it her? I'm sorry. Oh, my, I apologize. I think you're exactly right. See? Let me back up here. This is great. Um, but at any rate, the administration generated a couple of terms. Um, alternative facts, um, you know, maybe they didn't come up with fake news, but they use it a lot. Um, and you sometimes see official messages about political topics coming out, um, which really don't have any evidence behind them. Um, and again, not unique to, to Donald Trump. Um, I heard uh, the other day about someone, uh, a Democrat was saying the reason the unemployment rate is so low is because uh, a lot of people are working multiple jobs. And uh, I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the unemployment rate is not calculated that way. Like if you have two jobs, it's not the same as you and your neighbor both having one that in the statistics. That was the left-wing woman who just wanted Yeah, yeah, I wasn't, I, 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 I try not to name names other than a few of the really high profile people, but yeah. Well, she's pretty high profile. I, I guess she is now. No, you're right, she is now. Um, big surprise election in New York, yeah. Um, now, uh, I, I will be, I wanna be transparent up front, I've not read all the details. Maybe that quote was taken out of context. So I definitely wanna read all that before I kind of, you know, condemn uh, fully. But let's assume that's true for a moment. That sort of thing will get a lot of headlines, but is, is not really based in, in reality if you're talking about a number that is not actually calculated the way it's suggested. So, please. Comment, um, the, the silliness that comes out of the White House now, um, is is could be meant to be building blocks of what's the alt alternate and the alter the alternative is voting restrictions. Yeah. The greatest false story of the 20th century, 21st century so far is of course weapons of mass destruction that have reshaped all our lives in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And this is this is we, we get used to this silliness, but it has. 35% of the voters believe all that, right? mm -hmm. and and therefore, when when we have a foundation of the Bill of Rights the Constitution, in the Constitution, um, news media, right or left, conservative or not, have to pay attention to that. Right. right, because that is the fifth one. That yeah. is what we want. Yeah, absolutely. And the president, no matter what he or she does, is news. Right? What they tweet, where they go, you know, they're the only person, well, maybe not the only person. I was, I, was, I was challenging my students to come up with a person who could more easily than the president just walk into a room and spread their 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 thoughts with the world. Kim Kardashian. Kim Kim Kardashian. I was thinking it could be Kardashian. Uh, I was going to go with the Pope, but Kim Kardashian probably may have the Pope beat either. Although the Pope is on Twitter. I think there's a, a Pope reference a little bit later on uh, with Twitter. So. Hey, he has a son teaching English in China. And he married a Chinese woman and they had their second child, a girl. And their first choice for a name was Chloe. <coughs> and I thought, where'd they get that? And their second choice was Taylor. And I said, where's she getting these names? She's a Chinese woman. And he said, Kardashian and Swift. Swift, yeah. So culture yeah. is huge. Here. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, the, 
the sociology of names, by the way, just as a side note, is so interesting. I was looking at some data about how the use of the name Katrina dropped after 2005 as a name. It's just fascinating how that works. Um, but uh, yeah, um, again, we could go on. This one is, um, actually in some ways these are easy because if we can empirically demonstrate something to be false, then we can kind of write it off. Um, but you know, I appreciate that a lot of this stuff is somewhat opinion um, oriented or somewhat subjected in its interpretation. 99,000 people are liking it and another 30,000 are retweeting it. And that was as of whenever yeah. I took the screenshot. So um, yeah, and we'll actually see another one of those uh, things come up in a little bit. Um, that uh, it suggests again, even if there was a correction here, how many people re we we tweet <laughs> we retweet? Re that's the right way. But that's uh, the retraction be with regular news too. You yeah. never, as you said, yeah. get the correction to the people that read the initial right uh, yeah, initial right. report. And with Trump, I think um, I look at this and I think if you say he's the most powerful person and can walk into a room and command attention. That's true, except because of the filter of what he is saying, going out through the um, uh, the daily news uh, reports and the way that the reporters handle whatever's being said, mm -hmm. then you look at what he's doing through Twitter to try to overcome what he feels right. is, of course, the bias of the regular media, right, right. where when he was having those campaign rallies, how they would never pan the audience, he would say, because they didn't want people to know how big his group was. Sure. So you're saying he's trying somehow to get past the bias of CNN and MSNBC and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at the Twitter thing and you're saying, I don't know if this is a true quote or not and if it has any factual evidence to it, but you're saying then what does somebody do if they feel that they're opposed by 99% of the people that are supposed to give us fair news. Right. And so you're going to a method like this. Right. And then there's going to be issues on this side too. Yeah. And one thing you have to give the, the president credit for, um, just in, in a purely empirical sense, is he has mastered using media to bypass the media. It's kind of a, you know, amazing, really. Uh, there's an old model of presidential leadership called going public, which is the idea of if Congress is not playing ball, I'm just gonna go to Congress's boss, make the case to them and try and get them to put pressure on Congress. And that's what presidents used to do. They'd give the State of the Union and then they'd go out and give speeches about it and try and get the voters. Um, now, you just tweet from the Oval Office, you tweet from the couch, wherever, um, but you're bypassing that filter, like you say. Um, there's a, an important thing though, which is that People choose who they follow on Twitter, they choose the channels they watch, so um, there's that self-reinforcing mechanism that a couple of you were referencing already about um, you know, who the, the people that like him are gonna watch it and agree with it and not gonna question it even if someone else does. The people that don't like him also have a tendency to disregard something that may very well be true, which is part of that human um, fallibility that we'll talk about in a bit. But that's a really good point about that the bypass and as a, as a scholarly community, we are still now just trying to figure out how that works. I think Reagan did it too, they said. That. He did, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's not real new, but it is. But what is happening, I think, is that people are choosing, like you said, their news sources. Some people aren't going to watch MSNBC, and some aren't going to watch Fox. And then so you've got, yeah. or CNN, or whatever it is, because they don't trust yep. what exactly. they're getting from it. So exactly. then we're getting more information from one one side right right and we'll actually hit on that again just gosh you're all so far ahead of me this is fantastic um that, that very concept us. yeah you must be leading us in <laughs> uh yeah we'll certainly come back to it so yeah sorry thanks for waiting what what's uh, on your mind a concern i have is so far we've been talking about basically things where our intelligent people can see it <laughs> yes yep, okay. yep exactly but there is an awful lot of shaping of the news which is due to a loss of editorial diversity, uh, big corporations owning a lot of media, and it, it, it's not hard censorship. It's simply, well, this is kind of how we want things to be portrayed. Right, right. Uh, also, there's things like, okay, we've got a small newspaper here, and it's struggling. 
and it is looking for content, and it gets articles from the Heritage Foundation for free. Right. And so there is no alternative views given compared to what they have to say. Right. And uh, so it, it's so subtle that it can't be seen easily, but it is there. Right. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I think those things are, are actually linked together. You're bringing in the economic element, um, which, you know, it, I'm happy to talk about. I think it's incredibly important. Um, again, for the sake of this, I had to think about what, what should we prioritize? Um, but you think about things like, you know, the New York Times and the Washington Post used to have reporters embedded in Moscow or Beijing or uh, Buenos Aires, you know, where, wherever. Um, and you're seeing more of those satellites closing down. You're seeing more media outlets you know, subscribing to the AP, and so everybody gets the same 400 words. Um, the smaller newspaper shutting down. The, yeah, these are all the the economics of journalism are incredibly relevant, not just to the agenda setting bias, which we we mentioned before, um, but also very much to some of these more subtle influences. That you're right. If you stop and think about it, they make sense. But we don't inherently stop and think about. Oh, this story actually is from the AP wire. It's not actually from a Washington Post reporter. And why should we care? Right, so I, I completely agree. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll transition too to um, talking a little bit about how we're not always so geared at being able to seek out the truth. Um, now this is just a summary of all the things that I just sent. So again, I'm happy to share this. I know it's not um, uh, the easiest necessarily to see, but it's just a nice little um, visual summary of that uh, typology. Uh, and again, feel free to reject or to challenge. I think that's what we ought to be doing when we're talking about this stuff. But I do think it's helpful to think about fake news as more than a yes or no thing, because it is highly conditional and highly contextual in many cases. So um, with that, uh, I want to talk briefly about the threat fake news poses. And this actually came up a bit in my class this, this summer. A few of my kiddos were asking, um, you know, like, okay, so fake news doesn't sound like a good thing, but why is it bad? If people are just gonna seek out the information they want and they want sensationalist, why not just let people do their thing? Um, and that's a good question. So, you know, why is this a threat democratically? Um, and if you stop and think about it, I think there are, oops, sorry, I think there are three big things that we need to bear in mind, three big concerns that ought to make this something that we concern ourselves with. Um, the first is the, perhaps the most obvious, if people get false information and choose to act on it, there could be some serious repercussions. If somebody reads a story, um, and uh, you know, thinks uh, the world is ending. You know, H.G. Wells type stuff. Pizza um, parlor. Yeah. 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 The pizza parlor. Yep. Exactly. Oh, okay. um, so yeah, it, exactly. People read something false and then act on it. And if that action is is violent um, or criminal or something, you know, you can certainly see the potential for people getting really fired up and doing. You know, you think about things like you know the Charlottesville incidents and some of these super emotionally charged, you know, protests, counter protests and that, you could imagine something getting tweeted out and sent around those crowds that's really inflammatory and you have people who are already really excited and perhaps really angry. Um, and it, it's not hard to see that leading to some really bad places. So if for no other reason, I think we should be worried about this uh, because of the potential for it to lead to bad actions. Uh, the second one, this may sound a little more academic, um, but I actually think this is something really important, which is Fake news makes it a lot harder for us to have the conversations that a lot of us claim we want to have. We talk about the lack of civility, the lack of civil discourse, the inability for the right and the left to come together. You know, you hear these kind of longing references to Sam Rayburn and Tip O'Neill and Reagan and the idea of Congress yells at each other from nine to five and then from five to 5.30 tells the media how terrible the other party is and then at six o'clock they meet for drinks and dinner and they write the legislation and get it done. Like we kind of have this image of that's how it should be. Um, I don't know if it always worked that way, but there were certainly times when it seemed that uh, there was kind of a, uh, an outside world kind of you know, political spin, but when it really came down to it, people came together to get important things done. Um, so I, I, I would submit uh, that, that fake news probably does not contribute to that civility. Um, and then uh, finally, this one, I, this is just kind of a gut instinct I have. I have no empirical evidence of this. So um, we, we can just take it as a cautionary warning, but I, I think there's something to it. Um, and that is that if we're living in a world where people are increasingly challenging the veracity and the validity of political content, um, 
we develop skepticism and then we develop cynicism and I could easily see us getting to a point where people are disinclined to, re to, to accept even true things. Um, one thing that you know, I've seen a lot in recent elections is you know, people throw out rumors or innuendo or challenges and I, I could be wrong, but part of my hunch is that politicians think that if they can't win on the merits of the argument, the next best thing may be to just confuse everybody and just get you know everybody being not sure what the true unemployment rate is, not sure of what so-and-so did as governor of Massachusetts or whatever, um, and then people just kind of throw their hands up and say, oh, okay, well, I, I can't be bothered to get all the details. I'm just going to vote based on party or you know how the stock market's doing, something like that. So um, again, this is just a hunch. I don't have a sense that this is an existential problem yet, but I do worry that if we all start to think we can't trust, We'll also not trust what's right and what's true, and that could potentially lead to some bad. Well, it happened. It happened with with uh, Obama's birth certificate. Okay. To this day, yeah. there's 30 percent of the people mm -hmm. that believe he was never born in the yeah. United States and should not have been president. And, and arguably, that was Donald Trump's emergent That's right. on the on the political scene in this country. Yes, sir. The big danger here is the corrosion of faith in our institutions, in the press. Can I borrow that in phrase government. when I update this? Corrosion of faith. That is a perfect way of putting it. Yeah, that, that's a very articulate way of putting it. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing we've seen is a, a pretty steady decline in trust. Um, you know, back in the, the 40s and 50s and 60s, kind of pre, certainly pre-Vietnam and then definitely pre-Watergate, um, there was much more of kind of a, a friendly, casual uh, relationship between you know the press and the media and the people in the press and all that you know you hear these stories about you know the media saw you know John Kennedy had some woman over or you know Richard Nixon had something going on and you'd think could you imagine them not writing a story about that today um, so yeah that that broader trust I think is only accelerated uh, perhaps exponentially um, by this trend so yeah corrosion of faith I love that term that's that's exactly right um, um, I want to make oh, a comment on that. I don't think that was, you know, I don't believe in the good old days, quote unquote. Right. And I think Fair that enough. what we didn't have then was, um, like you said before, a diversity of uh, viewpoints in the news and the secret covering up stuff about things that men may or may not have done. We're seeing now what happens when. You know, with the Me Too movement, so I'm not willing yeah. to trade that for back when how it used to be. Right, right. No, it's certainly that's a really, really that important stuff. point. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really important point. Um, and I, 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 I definitely want to distinguish between kind of the the substance, the political reality of what life was like, and kind of the nature of trust. Um, I was referring more to things like if Walter Cronkite said it. It must be true. Yeah. Um, that kind of trust is where I, where I was referencing. But you're certainly right that the you know the nature of society certainly left a lot to be desired, and perhaps in some ways that have not been remedied or rectified. Well, so I, I feel like we're you know we keep uncovering more and more stuff about the people delivering the news as well yeah. as oh yeah Matt, La uh, Matt Lauer so it, and yeah it really makes us have to think about what to believe or what to think about what we believe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. When I talk about elections and we talk about all the negative advertising that goes on today and, and sometimes sometimes my students will say, gosh, it's getting so bad. <laughs> and, I, and, and I said to them, did you see the ads from the 1800 election? They were awful, you know? They were using the equivalent of even worse than we see now. So part of it I think is just a, a political and societal reality and not just a technological one. So that's a really important addendum and I really appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, not that we want to go back to the good old days, but I can remember when a person of the opposite party that you were supporting won and it didn't seem like the world was going to collapse. Mm -hmm. I remember when um, uh, John F. Kennedy beat Nixon and I was very young. But, you know, uh, I, I thought, oh, I thought, we had no idea what the first Catholic was going to bring in and all these things mm -hmm. that were spoken about. But it wasn't that you thought it was going to be the end of the world if your person did not win. Mm -hmm. And yet now, with the Trump election, half of the population went into hysterics and couldn't seem to handle the loss of their uh, particular candidate. Yeah. And so I think that's the difference is that it's almost hysterical mm -hmm. instead of just like, all right, we go through just like people that didn't want Obama, 
went through two cycles of that and you think, okay, we come out on the other side and we, we try again. But, but this election was, all I can think of was hysterical. People were not behaving rationally in accepting the election of one person over the other. Right, right. yeah. Oh, no, it was very activating for a lot of people. I have... Um, More than just activating, um, it was absolutely nullifying. They just refused... Right. Well, and they also, some of them refused to come to class for a few days. Really? Or go, yeah, I mean, not everybody, but yeah, there were some, some people who were so, so upset. Uh, upset, so moved by it. See, that's, um, that's you know, I had other people who started wearing all red or Make America Great stuff. And I remember even like in 2004, Republicans weren't necessarily crowing about it, you know, and when, yeah, there, there may have been some of that, but um, there's certainly... Uh, something new and, and one thing that I think is really important for all of us to be thinking about I know political scientists are is was 2016 an aberration or is it the start of something new um, because a lot of the theories about how the media work or how politics works we've been kind of questioning that and saying is there a new paradigm now you know is it is it Twitter is being vulgar the way to go do people want character attacks rather than policy attacks and time will tell with that one. But one thing that was interesting about 2016 is the number of people who felt strongly, but not because of specific ideological or policy views, right? Um, back in, I think it was 2015, December of 2015, I remember reading an article, and the, the, the headline was something to the effect of, um, Trump is the best thing that could happen to liberals, or something like that. And the point of the article was, among all the Republicans running for the nomination, Donald Trump actually had a, a history of donating a lot of money to Democrats. He seemed to be pro-choice, um, at least you know on, on some records. And so some people are actually articulating that he wasn't really ideological. He, he not really a conservative. His brand of politics, you know, the the populism approach, is not historically what has driven the conservative movement. And even now, um, you you could argue, you know, that he has one of the. Gosh, I'm sorry. I just need to step back. Uh, that you could argue that he has one of the less or least cohesive ideologies of, of recent presidents. You know, most of them are, have been pretty clear. Um, but there's been a lot more of just kind of like what's going on today, what's, what's convenient, or what am I feeling? Um, there's not as much consistency. And so we'll see if that becomes a trend. I, my hunch is it's an outlier, but again, I also said there's no way this guy wins. Oh, <laughs> you're right. Well, you know, there's I have a few comments, and they won't be long, but they will be... Um, detailed in that we're holding this discussion in a library. Okay, check out a book. Well, we, people are so immature and childish that they want it handed to them like feeding you baby food. Go find out what's going on. For real. And the way you do that is by reading a lot. When Katie Couric said to, what's her name? What is her name? Sarah Palin. Sarah Palin. What do you read? The woman was dumbfounded. What the heck do you mean? You can't answer that? Our leaders need to be informed that there's no, do you know what's happening down at the front of this library right now? Do you know? Do I Can know? you stand up and tell me what's happening down at the front door of this library? Answer me. No, you can't. Are you a superwoman? Can you see through walls? Do you know what's happening down there? No, what's happening? No, what journalist knows what's happening down there? I see what you're saying. Not you see what I'm saying? Everything. No human being can do what you're asking them to do. It is up to us in a free society to be informed and to find out what's going on. And the way you do that is by reading a lot of different sources. And then eventually you come to understand which is a trusted source and which one is trying to bullshit you. Okay, yeah, I think it's just people a lot of it's just like a doctor. I worked for a doctor whose daughter became a doctor, and she complained to her father, "I can't keep up." And what she meant by that was she couldn't keep up with the daily literature coming out about new stuff happening in the field, and she was a professional trying to be a good doctor. And he gave her advice, read a little bit every day. So what a professor of mine at Parkside said, this class is to give you the information to judge for yourself what's true and false. Thank and you. that's <laughs> where it comes from. Thank you. And until people take responsibility for that, you know, 
I, I don't care who you. I don't care who's <laughs> telling what to who, but when they detonate a bomb because some a nuclear weapon because somebody's playing chicken with a you know crazy people are playing chicken with each other using Excuse nuclear me. Thank you for your input, but I came here to hear Excuse him. me, I have a right for a comment and people have made many comments and I'll finish mine. Thank you. And when they ne detonate that bomb I'll tell you where the real news is coming from, and that's the person that's going to tell you how to save yourself from the fallout. And then you'll know where the real news is coming from. And that'll actually be related to one of the, the uh, tips towards the end about taking time to educate yourself and seeking out more than the one or the two that you like. So <clears throat> again, really, uh, really appreciate it. Sometimes my, my students do not uh, get engaged nearly as much as they should, and partially for this reason here. Um, uh, again, I try not to lecture at them very, very much, um, tell them what to think or how to live, but one thing I really try to implore uh, on them is, you know, you and I remember journalism in a different way than, than they do, and they grew up with types of technologies and things which make it a lot harder to always get at the truth. So uh, there's been some research looking at different types of people and how well they can identify fake news. Um, and the, uh, the evidence is not encouraging uh, when it comes to younger people. Uh, now again, I don't want to throw them under the bus or say that it's not possible. They're also students and still learning. Um, but one thing I think growing up on this technology and this instant gratification and highly, highly selective um, media source kind of world we live in is it can make it a lot harder for people who grow up, grew up with that who don't have the foresight to think about how do I uh, find alternative viewpoints. How do I check to see if this is real? Uh, this is especially relevant, I think, to younger audiences. So, you know, if you ever have a chance to, to preach uh, the, the education uh, element, please do, because uh, I, I will be very, very happy to see us make a dent in that. So, um, uh, I thought I'd also briefly touch on just a few things that come up when I've talked about media and fake news in the past. Um, we can certainly build on them if you wish, but uh, well, let's start with this question of how can this be legal, right? I get this question a lot. It's a lie. Lying can't be legal. Um, and I don't want to get into all of the, the, the details and the legal stuff, uh, partially because I don't know it all, partially because I think it's really boring personally. Um, but I'll just share with you more generally that the Supreme Court, as you may know, is very protective of speech, historically and today. Um, and when I say that, I mean things like hate speech is perfectly legal in this country, provided you don't meet uh, what's, um, you don't meet a threshold where it uh, directly incites imminent lawless action. Um, so, and, and there's a debate about have I done that? If I go to a Trump rally and start shouting things at people and they come at me with fists, have I incited that or is that just me speaking freely? Uh, the First Amendment is very, very tricky in this way. But just as a, as a broad principle, the Supreme Court has been very protective of things like this. Um, doesn't mean you can't get fired for using a racial epithet. Your private employer can can penalize you for that. But as far as the government's ability uh, to limit what, what you say and what you do, uh, it's, it's you know, highly restricted. Uh, anyone following campaign finance law and the Citizens United case of 2010, uh, that was another huge victory for people who interpreted that money should also count as a form of free speech. And uh, there's a quote here from a f fictitious character in a fictitious show, but I think he makes a good point. He said, making sure the National Enquirer can write whatever it wants is the only way I could be sure the New York Times is writing whatever it wants. And he's kind of making the case that uh, the government can't be in charge of deciding you know, who is media, what can they say, who gets credentials, who gets to come to the press conference. Because if I want to be sure that all the legitimate media out there are getting to do their job, then I also have to let some of the more fringe elements do what they want to do as well. So again, fairly or unfairly, we can do a whole separate talk on the First Amendment if you want. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. But as far as the legality, um, it's really, really tough, partly because of the First Amendment, um, even more so because of the fact that even though it is illegal to uh, slander, to engage in libel, um, it is really hard to prove in a court of law because you have to demonstrate people knowingly and maliciously were defaming you. And there's a lot of plausible deniability, even in cases where it looks pretty obvious that somebody is out to get you. Uh, so this is, legally speaking, a very difficult thing to prove. Uh, there's also, if you're a public official, the threshold is even higher. So people say some pretty bad things about Donald Trump. People say some bad things about Hillary Clinton, George Bush, Barack Obama. Because they're public figures, 
it's a lot harder to sue people for being critical of you. Uh, now, what exactly is a public figure? Uh, you know, how, how important, how high ranked in Congress do you have to be before it applies? Elected versus unelected? Uh, there's no specific definition. But as a general rule, if you're considered a public person, a public personality, uh, it is all that more uh, difficult to challenge somebody uh, who's been uh, ostensibly uh, you know, spreading lies or falsies about you because uh, simply because of the public status. Uh, uh, or yeah, or just under that, the public status. So, um, bottom line is, it you know, if you have a, a pure, true, straight up malicious lie printed, spoken, and you can prove all that, you may very well have a case. But given that we're talking about politics, where a lot of people can deny, and a lot of people are, are public figures, it is exceedingly difficult. I don't think this will be the way to to ultimately deal with it. Um, now, we finally, we get to. We get to one of the things I was really excited about because a couple of you referenced technology before um, and talking about why is fake news like getting so much attention now? Because we talked about, you know, the, the potential for, we talked about the potential for, uh, you know, fake news to have contributed to the assassination of McKinley. I mean, this isn't new, uh, but it's certainly on the rise and I'll argue that there are a few reasons why. Um, technology, both in terms of generating and disseminating content, um, and then also, you know, the, the ascension of Donald Trump in American politics, you know, cannot be untied from this conversation, right? Um, uh, the disseminating content part we'll get to in a sec, but I, I wanted to point to, uh, Barack Obama put it pretty well when he said, when you have social media sites like Facebook, uh, everything is quote, uh, true, uh, or quote, everything is true and nothing is true simultaneously. And we'll get to what we mean by that as well, but these things are, are a big part of it. Uh, so when John McCain, Senator John McCain was diagnosed with brain cancer uh, a, a couple years back. Uh, actually, it was just last summer, I think. Yeah, it was about a year ago, gosh. Uh, time flies. Uh, this made the rounds on, on some websites. Uh, a tweet, apparently from Barack Obama, John McCain is not a war hero. Um, if there were any God in heaven, he would have died from that brain tumor. Right. Um, now, Barack Obama ran a race against Senator McCain. He beat him. Um, they probably don't agree on a whole lot. Uh, does this sound like Barack Obama, though? No. <laughs> you know, I, I would hope even Republicans would question that. Um, and they should, because this is what actually was tweeted that day by Barack Obama. John McCain is an American hero and one of the bravest fighters I've ever known. Cancer does not know what it's up against. Give it hell, John. And this is a good example of, uh, you know, and I don't do this, I'm not on, on Twitter, but apparently there are any number of websites where you can go and impersonate accounts. And if you look closely, there are some differences, you know, like, where it says follow right there, there's that little, I guess that's the Twitter logo on the real one, it's not up here. Um, and some of the, you know, the orientation of some of the things are maybe a little bit different, but I mean, so much of it looks exactly the same, right? And if we're in a world where people are super hyped and looking to either confirm something um, or to be angered by something, uh, you know, that first one's gonna be pretty darn activating. You know, when I first saw it, now granted I was looking for examples, so I, I was, you know, I knew what I was getting into, but that would have really kind of made me upset, right? Um, at least for however long it took me to realize it, it wasn't real. That one is so inflammatory, I probably would have been like, there's no way. Um, but you can imagine some things being falsified that really make you think. So the technology is certainly making it easier. Um, here's the video you were talking about. Um, this is, I, 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 for the life of me, cannot decide if this is good or bad for society. Right now I lean towards bad, but there's some researchers that now can take audio and your picture and turn it into a video. So what they did was, uh, this is an actual video of Barack Obama giving a speech. And what they did was they took his picture here and then they merged it with this audio. And so this image here is completely computer generated. I, I, I have the link, I can show you. I wasn't sure if we'd have Wi-Fi, so I'm happy to email it to people. Uh, but essentially, this speech being told by this computer gener generated um, image, uh, it is startling. Are you going to play? How much it looks? I, I, I'm not connected on the Wi-Fi here. Oh, I don't know. Okay. I, I do have the link in here, so maybe we can, we can, if someone comes back, we can ask about it. Um, so they basically, they run side by side the real speech and then the computer generated exact same speech. It's really, really good. Um, now again, if it's for a movie, right? Especially now every movie has like 20 sequels. So sometimes you're going to need a character from 50 years ago to reappear as the same age they were 50 years ago. Maybe it's good for that. Uh, but when it comes to the potential for people wanting to spread falsities, uh, this is dangerous. Because so far, if you have video, that's the ball game, right? The video is, is considered proof, right? Uh, 
we may get to a point pretty soon where that's not true. And this just feels a little like 1984-ish to me, like it was started with the best of intentions, right? Um, and could pot potentially be manipulated. So uh, right now this is confined to universities. We'll see what happens from there. Um, and then the, the, the last little bit on this section I wanted to touch on was um, something you're probably all very familiar with, um, but something my, my students often aren't, which is uh, we are terrible at objectivity as human beings. Um, I pulled some, um, some data from right at the end of the last election where they asked people about, they asked people about uh, what most of us would consider to be objective standards, uh, things like the unemployment rate, stock market. And uh, at the very end of Barack Obama's term as president, 71% of Democrats believed unemployment went down under his administration. 25% of Republicans would say it went down. Uh, fewer than 50% of Democrats believed that the deficit or debt increased under Barack Obama. 85% of Republicans did. And I think this is a really clear example of uh, what some people call selective uh, uh, filtering or selective perception. There are a bunch of words. But it all basically gets back to the idea that in a political context especially, uh, we have a real tendency to engage in what's called confirmation bias. Right, to seek information that will confirm what we already believe in. It's why a lot of conservatives watch Fox and a lot of liberals watch MSNBC. Right? Um, it's psychological, it's cognitive, it's not at the surface level. We don't like to hear contrarian views, on, on especially on things like political values. So the fact that even objective information is perceived differently by people um, is, I think, really clear evidence that we need to be especially cautious with ourselves, not just the government and not just the media, but we all need to bear in mind our own potential to engage this way, and, and we all do it, myself included. Um, in fact, I even threw in, a, threw in an example of, uh, I, I use this in class a lot, sports is still a great way, but occasionally you'll see a, you know, a close <laughs> touchdown or a take care of, um, you know, some sort of touchdown or big play, and what's really fun is to go to the internet um, and say, okay, let's see what the Seattle fans think happened <laughs> in this situation versus what the Packers fans thought. Um, and it's just so systematically um, validated that just people see what they want to see, even in situations where the referees, who are perhaps the most objective people in any profession, uh, had, a, oops, had a hard time with. So one more thing I'll show you on this. I wanted to tell you about a little experiment I did with my students. Um, I had them read this article here, and it's fake, but I think it looks kind of real. It looks like a newspaper webpage, I hope. Um, so uh, my students read this, and then they were asked to comment was this a conservative article, liberal, was it fair, that kind of thing. Uh, here's the thing though, only about half my students read this one. The other half read this one. The exact same, the article. Exact same article. With a couple of tiny changes. Right? Um, and what that allowed me to do afterwards was to take the exact same article, same length, same words, same font, same everything, and see did the people who read, or the people who thought it was coming from MSNBC, think the article was meaningfully different than people who thought it came from Fox. And I think I accidentally turned it down. There we go. Um, this, one of the things I asked them was, how conservative do you think this article is? So uh, one is super liberal, and seven is the most conservative. And so one of the articles, the average was a 3.3, give or take. The other, the average was a 5.3. So 3.3 out of seven, or 5.3 out of seven, where seven is the most conservative. Uh, you know, if you had to bet your life savings on which of these articles was Fox and which one was MSNBC, you would probably guess that people who read an article from Fox perceived it as much more conservative than the, ex here's the key, the exact same article from MSNBC. And the point I try to make with my kiddos with this is, this was your bias, right? This was, was you making an assumption about what you were reading based on where it came from. And that's not to say the assumption is invalid, but the point of this is, is to say, you make decisions, you probably don't even think about it, but when you see that it's from Fox, or that it was written by a woman, right, or it was, the guy was wearing this colored shirt, right, uh, these little cues can very much impact what we think of the exact same substance after. So again, going back to this idea that uh, there's nothing wrong with us, it's, it's, it probably goes back to like the biology of survival, but we like our own teams, we like to be validated, we don't like to be challenged, and uh, unfortunately, in the, in the case of fake news, um, 
it, it makes politics a bit more difficult. So um, why don't we end by talking a little bit about some of the things that actually a number of you have referenced already concerning what do we do about this? And there's obviously you know hundreds of articles written about here's the solution. Um, I tend to believe there's no one solution. I think it's multifaceted. And I tried to organize a, some of my, excuse me, tried to organize a few of uh, my main thoughts and takeaways from having scanned all of this literature. So the first question, which is pretty controversial, you might imagine, is should the government be regulating this? Right? Um, and actually, in some places, particularly in Europe, um, uh, after World War II and, and, and some of the experiences that are somewhat unique to that continent, uh, there were some much more active moves by the government to regulate speech. There are questions now about should Facebook and Twitter be following the First Amendment? They are under no obligation to do so, right? They're a private company. Uh, but should they be using the same standards as the government when it comes to regulating speech? Uh, I don't have the, a, a right answer for that. Um, but you know, there are a number of people, in, including people in high places, who think the government ought to be more involved in regulating this stuff, in deciding what is true um, and untrue. And the basic argument here is the First Amendment is too protective, right? It's too lenient, and we would, we as a society would be a lot better off if we were to put some limits. Like, yes, that would you know constrain you in some ways, but society would be better off if you were not allowed to say this or that. And this is not unique to fake news. We hear this conversation with things like you know racial slurs. Should they be banned? Right. That's a, that's an ongoing debate too, as far as you know where should the First Amendment go. Um, my, my own personal take is that the government may not be the best solution, um, not because that they, they couldn't or it, it wouldn't be possible, but just because one of the dangers with any government is if you, if you grant authority to somebody, uh, they have that authority and there's the potential for abuse, right? That's part of the reason we have a, a free private media that's not linked to the state. The idea is that they will be a stronger check on the state if they're not part of it. Well, people are in the government. They hold the same biases that you just right. pointed out for right. everybody else. Exactly. Really yeah. Fix anything. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and there's actually even evidence of the, in this country. We have to go back a few ways, but we've we've passed legislation that banned certain types of speech or certain types of criticism of the government, um, and it didn't always go well. Um, you know, uh, I'm I'm generally a pretty big fan of John Adams, um, but a lot of people have criticized his administration for kind of manipulating this into limiting speech by opponents uh, of him politically, not people who are you know, truly out to subvert the US government. So um, you can imagine in, in non-democratic countries, this will potentially be even worse, right? Yes. Um, as some people argue it is now. So um, again, I, I uh, appreciate the potential for the government to provide guidance on this. Uh, but again, I don't know personally if, if that would be the, the right way. It might be part of it. Um, but as far as what we can do, here, here are a few big takeaways. Um, this guy, David Remnick, I think, came up with a really good analogy. And he said we should think of fake news the way we think about pollution. Um, it is not a feasible objective to rid the world of it, right? Maybe someday, centuries from now, we'll get to a point where we can be emissions free or whatever. Um, but it's certainly not plausible in any of our lifetimes. And so he said the solution is not let's get rid of everything. The solution is let's minimize it. Let's take the steps we can to innovate and try to prevent it from getting any worse than it you know, could possibly be under provisions like free speech. So uh, here are a couple of the highlights. Uh, number one, which you were getting at earlier, is the, the big picture education. The idea of we need to make this a priority. To you know, one thing I'm really big on in my courses is what I, is what's called data literacy. Um, I teach research methods, and I'm really keen on my students knowing exactly how to read a poll, right? And what a margin of error is. And what happens when you write a question a particular way? Mm -hmm. All that kind of stuff. I'm big on data literacy, and I think it's really huge for this too. So that could be library programs, that could be courses in high schools, that could be government-issued pamphlets. There's a lot we can do. But the, the big picture education component, I think, is, is huge. Uh, part of that is, uh, I would argue, we ought to create a culture of skepticism. Um, and by that, I don't mean cynicism. I don't mean never believe anything. But one thing I tell my students all the time is this. Make people convince you. Whether it is statistical, or if someone's making a political argument, they're trying to persuade you, um, don't believe the first thing you see. Don't assume that because a president said it, that it's right, right? Um, make people convince you. 
Um, here's our Pope reference, yeah. So in 2018, uh, the, the Pope, there's, there's World Communication Day, which I didn't know about until recently, um, but the Pope uh, chose a theme, and the, the theme was the truth will set you free. And he actually referenced fake news and journalism in that. So, um, you know, the Pope is, is doing, doing his part for this big picture education, and um, I would, would encourage all of us in any way we can promote it to do that as well. Uh, number two, corporate responsibility. It's kind of a cop-out. We can all say the corporate nations ought to do more. Um, but what I mean is, um, you know, maybe companies that are, you know, the middle people who may be uh, hosting the platforms that can be used to disseminate information, for instance, um, should they be doing more? And, you know, again, it's very dangerous uh, because if Google and Facebook come out and say, I'm going to start regulating fake news, that is a person deciding what is fake, what isn't, what should the rules be, how fake does it have to be before we filter it, things like that. So again, the human fallibility is going to be inherent everywhere, no matter how we do this, which is why I don't think any one approach is the right way to go. Um, but again, uh, maybe part of the solution is people who have the potential to influence how the, the, you know, the, the uh, various methods and mediums work, whether that's Fox News or Facebook. Um, there may be some things they can do, you know, various you know, uh, tests that have to be passed before something can get printed, that kind of thing. Um, number three, again, this is something we can all get behind. This would be one of my campaign platforms if I ever ran for office. Um, but promoting transparency, um, which is to say, make it easy for people to check things, right? Um, I have, uh, my, the, the woman I'm seeing right now had a, a, a medical something, which she's fine, but she got a medical bill. Um, and the trouble she has gone to trying to get the right person on the phone to pay that bill is crazy to me. And um, I don't know, maybe they're hoping that she'll miss the deadline and they can collect more. I don't know, I hope they're not that sinister. Um, but if we can do things to make it easier to validate claims, to double check things, uh, I think that would be great. Um, so this could, yeah, sorry. I can just try um, perfect. Uh, so this could be really simple. This could be things like governments making it easy to access original documents, um, you know, I know most people record like town council meetings and stuff like that, uh, but you know, create listservs, email that out to the people, place it prominently. Um, I but think these are all things. Point, we can do. do people still have to seek out the information? Yes, absolutely. Um, this one is definitely for the people that are willing to put in some effort, but not as much as many of us think they're capable of putting in. Right. So, um, absolutely true. And here's an example of maybe how that would work. This, this uh, county, I believe it's in Florida, this, this school district, they actually have on on their uh, school, their, their district webpage, they have a, a rumor control area where you can go and see what rumors are going on and then they give you the facts. Um, now again though, if we go back to a couple of slides, um, obviously they may decide what to put up and, and what, what counts as a fact. So again, none of this is by itself going to solve it because these are all potentially corruptible. Um, but if we put it all together, we may be able to make some progress. Um, the, the, the fourth one and the big one um, I think is really at the consumer end that you and me, which is uh, developing and cultivating the skills necessary to check things out. So um, I put a, a, a handful here of what I think are really important ones. There's probably 200 at this point. Um, but uh, things like being skeptical of headlines, if you see an exclamation point, right, that's usually a red flag. If you see all capital letters, things like that, those are often, you know, not, not um, trying to hide the fact that they're kind of clickbaity. Um, I mentioned before the tendency for people to only read the headline. You know, if you see a headline and, and you're thinking about the issue, do read on. Not enough people do that. Um, even if it's legitimate stuff, uh, but in, and to, again, bear in mind, we have a private media in this country. That means just like Walmart, just like Southwest Airlines, just like everybody, they are looking at their bottom line, and there's nothing wrong with that if they're a corporation, but that does mean that they are providing a product to people. And uh, what's good for the bottom line may or may not be what's good for democracy, right? Uh, so, continuing on with this, um, this is a, a, a good one. Uh, if, you're, if you get a link to something, look very closely at it. You may have been uh, told you can like put your mouse over the link, just hover, don't click it, but to hover over it, and you can see if, if anything looks funny with um, that little, I don't know what it's called, but that little thing that pops up. Uh, one thing the fake news people have done, uh, which again is really, really sad, although it's crafty, is they'll do things like create websites, abcnews.com.co, right? That's not abcnews.com, but it looks pretty darn close. 
Um, sometimes you'll see, uh, I know I, I saw someone in New York send me a picture once of like a TV and it looked like a name brand, right? Like, like uh, uh, one? Panasonic or Samsonite, one of those things. And it was a knockoff company and they added a vowel, right? It was like Samson OA or something like that, but everything else looked exactly the same. Uh, look, looking at those details are really helpful. Um, who wrote the thing? If you can't tell who wrote it, that's a red flag. Um, if it's someone you're not familiar with, Google the author. Are they economists? Are they professors? Are they commentators? Have they written a lot? Things like that, looking into the, the person or persons it's coming from, I think uh, goes a long way in identifying. Um, kind of in a similar vein, if it's like a website or somewhere maybe that you don't know much about, um, you know, a lot of legitimate websites will have like an about section, like here's our story. We were founded in 2013, two sisters that just wanted to do good in the world, you know, something like that. Um, so if you're not sure about sources, looking at things like about sections, um, Wikipedia sometimes can be very good at like, oh, this is a, a website that tells jokes for a living or something like that. Um, similarly, I don't think this is terribly innovative to people who self-selected to come to this talk, right? Uh, but things like, you know, if people are citing sources, if they are citing the FAA or the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, uh, those documents should be available, you know, provided it's not something classified. Uh, so look into it. If it's not easy to find, then you got to ask yourself, how do these people do it? Um, come on, friend. Um, another big one that I think can be really helpful is, are other people reporting the same story? If there's a story that only one outlet is telling, that should give you pause. Because if it's, if it's a really good story and CNN's running it, then presumably Fox and MSNBC and ABC and NBC uh, would also be telling that story. So um, an easy way to do that is to just Google the keywords of the story, you know, nuclear meltdown Iceland or whatever. Um, and if everybody's reporting on it, it's probably much more legitimate. So um, that one's not too taxing. Um, this one may sound obvious as well. I know some people here have education connections, but things like really bad grammar, bad spelling. Um, I don't know if it's just they lack faith in us, the people who write some of these headlines, or they think we just don't care. Uh, but apparently enough people will still click on things that are misspelled or, or not uh, written properly. So anything that looks funky that way should be a red flag. Um, we, saw, we saw before how photos could be doctored even more easily now than ever. So again, if something looks kind of weird, you, you know, Google that photo, you can search by images in Google. Um, and if you're not finding it, it's more likely than not going to be doctored. Um, and then another one that uh, I, I don't hear much about, but it can often be very helpful, is double check the dates on things. When did that person say that, right? Did they say that during the Cold War? Right, because a, a, a quote about Russia from 1984 you know, I'm, I wouldn't expect every politician to maybe say the exact same thing today, um, or maybe they would, but maybe five years ago would be different. So checking dates on things, is it actually topical? Um, and uh, again, there's, I could just go on and on, but I really wanted to end with this. I don't wanna let the media off the hook and I don't wanna let the government off the hook or the politicians. I'm as critical of them as anybody, um, but uh, I really, really try to stress to anyone who will listen that um, it's important for all of us to just be mindful of the proclivities and tendencies that we have, not as partisans, um, but just as, as people. Just humans are, are not wired to seek pure truth, objectivity all the time. Uh, so I think it can go a, a really long way just being, being aware of that stuff. And it doesn't mean anything's wrong with us or anything like that. Um, but we talk so much, especially in our education system, about you know, truth and objectivity and facts. And that's all wonderful. Um, but there's a human element to all of this stuff. And even deciding things like what is a good economy is subject to debate. Right? So, um, uh, and then the final one, because I see this all the time, <laughs> is people who share stories. You know where I see it a lot is things like coupons. Like, yes. you know, Walmart has a killer deal, you know, 50 inch television <laughs> for $39 uh, or whatever, right? Um, and I've been guilty, by the way. I will absolutely concede I've been guilty from time to time of not investigating those and being like, oh, this is so awesome, I should share it with my buddies. Um, but that can be, uh, uh, hopefully that one will we be sufficiently embarrassed that we learn our lesson. But, um, you know, again, when we're thinking about ourselves and what we can do, um, I think thinking about our own biases is important and then also just thinking 
you know, how can I be a good steward of the truth? Which, because that, that sounds so idealistic. Um, but I really think we can do it. I think it's important that we try at least. So um, I did include one link in here, which just has, I mean, just pages and pages of tips. Um, I didn't want to go through all of them, but I went through the ones that I think are especially relevant. And again, I'm happy to share everything, pushing towards that transparency goal. I am, after all, technically a government employee. So um, all this stuff I'm, I'm totally happy to share, to follow up with any of you. But um, I'll kind of wrap up there, because I know we've been going for well over an hour now. I really appreciate all the stuff that you've had to add, too. It breaks things up for me. So um, I'm happy to chat for a bit, too, if yeah. there's other things to get into. Just a, a comment on, on the news media. Yeah. There's an old saying, it depends on whose ox is being gored. Right. Uh, during the campaign, all the news media appeared to be be joking about what was going on and not taking it seriously. And then they got um, slapped down when the election occurred. And they're slowly, some more than others, coming back to what they believe in in journalism. And you have the, the dichotomy between the talking heads reporting the news versus the real journalists who are analyzing the news and making a point. Mm -hmm. And I think it's getting better, but I like your viewpoint of, of, of that. You know, it's, 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 so, it's so tough. I, uh, I, I always joke with my kids, like, my goal in every course evaluation is to be accused of being too conservative and too liberal by the same group of students. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not... Uh, well, uh, it, how about it, an I, example of what you meant? But it, how do you think it's I'll, getting better? I'll put together better? some thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I was a little struck by that as well. How do you think it's getting better? Or well, who is getting better? What, what well, on the, uh, on the standard cable news, the talking heads are actually blinking when they hear something from the White House right. and, and saying, can this be really true? Right. Then you have the hardcore journalists who are on, call it what you will, CNN, MSNBC, who actually produce what their version, it's not a version of facts, it's the facts here, right. is. somebody's been right. indicted, somebody's not been indicted. That's not, that's not hearsay, it's fact. And I see more and more of that occurring with the blinking of, of did he really say that? And, and right. So I kind of avoid the talking heads because they don't know where to go with it because it is bottom line and they right. have 22 minutes of, of talking about whatever they are told to talk about. Right. And that goes back very much to the distinction between the talking heads and, and the journalists, right? The what, what we call hard news versus no. soft news. Um, you know, empirically speaking, um, I, I can't say with authority that, oh, they are getting better, they are blinking more. I mean, if that's your sense, then hopefully that is, in fact, reality. And there has been, I think, after 2016 and some of the big kind of fake news issues that have been coming up, uh, I know a number of outlets have been a little bit more diligent about, uh, you know, double-checking things or putting links on, on the television screen. So in that sense, hopefully there is kind of a positive backlash from this. Um, I go back to, though, uh, you know, the number of people that are seeking out hard news and want the blinking versus the people that are seeking out the talking heads. And I don't have the numbers on, on me, but there's a great book. Uh, it's an academic book, but I think it's readable, um, called The Post-Broadcast Democracy by a professor named Marcus Pryor. And he basically argues that the advent of cable and the, and the Internet has led to a new form of polarization in this country where people who want politics and confirmation and all that stuff have more access to it than ever. You can get 24-7 of conservative, of liberal, of libertarian, whatever. Um, but also people that don't want access to things can avoid it more easily than ever. And you know, you go back to 1969, if your TV was on, you were watching Neil Armstrong. You had no choice. Right? Mm -hmm. That's all that was being covered. So he was saying that's an interesting path we're on now where you can more easily learn or more easily avoid. And I don't know that the blinking you're talking about will be able to make up for that that confirmation path, uh, but I do think it's great. I hope that those norms continue. Um, I my hunch is we still have a ways to go though before we get to that. But I do think fundamentally, people recognizing I am watching an entertainer or somebody who's giving me their opinion versus this is someone who's giving me the basic information I need to know to start thinking about things. That's something we need to very clearly emphasize. I almost wish they could have. You know how they have those like little parental notifications in the corner of the the TV rating. Wouldn't it be great to have something like that for you know you know this is hard news, soft news. Uh, this person yeah, used to make yeah. that used to work for the president, that kind of thing. But you can figure that out, like in your own life. You know, 
you're not going to be 100% accurate, but you know who's conning you. You know who's not got your best interests at heart. Okay? You know, some snake oil salesman comes right. up and tries but to sell you a bottle that's, that's going subjective. to that's cure. Subjective. No, it's not. You, somebody comes to your door, knocks on your door, and says, here, I have, this is going to cure cancer. It's 20 bucks. Buy it. You know better than that. Everybody does. I mean, we're not 100% accurate, but, but we a have a con artist thing. We, we're self-protective. It's human nature to be self-protective. And you can apply that to the people giving you facts and information. What is, you know, what is that about? Did, and the other thing is, like he said, how many people are picking this up? How many people are reporting it? And people do get punished for false things. Who's the latest guy that went? off uh, the nightly news on NBC um, uh, that they then yeah I you know I'm, I've, they fired I, him I'm drawing because a he, blank but I don't watch the shows as much so maybe I you know that he, I mean the guy was the nightly news on NBC the right. one that yeah. Lester Holt Brian, Brian, Brian Williams, Williams? Yeah, okay. was yanked off for being exaggerating and all of that sure so so you do pay consequences when you put something out there it cannot be totally false in the press, you'll be fired. The New York Times editors have been fired and all of that stuff. Right, and People right. catch up with you. And it's up to people to catch up with you. And one last comment is that this bias in education for science and technology and not the liberal arts, where are people going to learn how to protect their free society and themselves from every con information that comes along? Those Trying to, to knock kill stem the fields. liberal arts and <laughs> share, schools is share, the exact share your, wrong uh, way to go. Share your concerns. So, yeah, I, and, I, and I totally agree. Uh, I think where there's a little bit of difficulty sometimes is the degree to which people are interested in taking the time to do what you're talking about. Um, so, like when we think about that little, you know, uh, parental notification icon in the corner, uh, the idea there is not, I think, that parents couldn't figure out if it's child appropriate, but rather to give them a quick and easy way of making that judgment. So. Um, you know, my sense, I, I could be a little misanthropic or, or underappreciative. Um, I, I don't question that most people are capable of doing that. I do wonder sometimes how many of them are willing to take the time because yeah, so much of this stuff could be dispelled, like you said. What I'm saying is you don't, you just have to have your sixth sense. Like okay. this lady back here said, her candidate did not get elected when JFK got elected. People are afraid of what a Catholic would do and all that. True. But sh you wrote it out because you had a sixth sense about you know what what the whole thing could end up being and that's a good lesson for everybody and i feel the same way about this trump i'm like this guy's nuts man he's throwing around nuclear weapons and all this stuff but i'm having that sixth sense of exactly you know they're up to some stuff and they're doing this and they're doing that and you know the the one side gets heard, then the other side gets heard. It's it's an up and a down flow, and people want something different. And then they, you know, and so I have the sixth sense that it's going to be okay because people are going to speak out, and and when it's hurting too many people, or you understand the con that's coming along, people are going to put a stop to it. And that's exactly what's been happening, and that protects everybody. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, I was a couple to more say, comments. What I've been trying to do more is watch the primary sources, like yes. with the jail, yes. you know, with mm -hmm. the investigations. Mm -hmm. So I'm listening to the actual yes. comments that the senators are asking questions of the yes. Rosenstein. Yeah. And or, the trusted or, sources. Or Peter Strzok yeah. or something like right. that. So I'm trying to uh, deal myself with who do I believe? Do I believe this smirking person or do I believe this senator or et cetera? Right. Well, that's why I wish with the transparency issue yes. you mentioned, I think if we were, like, if the um, DOJ would release the information, if we could have the quotes, if we could have the information, we could make the decisions right. ourselves without going to the secondary sources because I don't like watching something and then turning to a new show and hearing them describe it in a totally different manner right. that I received the information. Yeah, that, that's a really awesome point. And the only thing I'll add, again, not to be too cynical, um, but this is a non-representative group in that we have people who are 
you know, seeking out information, find this interesting, probably more than average uh, shrewd about these things. Uh, my sense from looking at the research about how people in general tend to behave is I don't know how many people, again, would, would do that. I totally agree with you. I think it'd be wonderful. I think the danger is though that a lot of people don't have time or don't understand all the jargon and so they're what is the best way at YouTube cat videos. E exactly. <laughs> Myself that's included. Thing. That's a good thing. Yeah. That's a good thing because it, it all of it can be taken with a grain of salt because basically everybody's lives are moving along right. okay. Right. Okay, at least right here. Right. I mean, you know, people are being blown up in Gaza and you know, right. they're the Middle East is decimated, but you know, aside from that, you know, and at the point where that's not true they will pay attention. Right. Right. And by then there may be some bigger consequences. There may consequences be consequences than, and it's yeah. up to people who are paying attention to help others pay attention. I and totally to talk agree. about it and to open up and to say, you know, well, I felt this way yesterday, but I, you know, now I'm thinking a little different. We have it in our families. We have this very thing you're talking about. Right, right. You know, and one of my cousins is, her nephew is just like, you know, is he going to walk into a, theater and shoot somebody but she and they have exactly polar opposite views but what she consistently tells him is I love you but I'm never going to agree with you okay and now they've uh, managed to move forward from there right, and he's right. saying well now I can see your point of view on this and you know and they well, can we talk need, about we, it. we absolutely need more of that. You know, that's what, the only way. One thing you didn't touch on is the whole thing about anonymity and how easy okay. it is for people yeah. to say anything because they're not being held responsible right. for their speech. But you know, that isn't quite true because some of this stuff on Facebook, that young baseball player that I heard about recently that said something on Facebook when he was 17, Hater was his name or something. Oh, yeah. And somebody found out when seven years later, so he was 17, and they track you. Somehow. But I'm just saying it's so easy to say anything awful if you're if you're right. not saying, well, it's so, you know, I am right. so and so and I'm standing up for what I believe in. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But the point is that if you, do that? If you don't. Oh, yeah. Well, you can fake, fake your identity, right. too. I mean, so. Well, I do a lot of, in my classes, I, I have my students take some surveys from me anonymously so I can gather some of the political mm -hmm. views that they would not, and they will say, I would never want to say this out loud, but if we have it anonymously, it can be very helpful, but it also opens up the door to- Can I attention, please? The public library is closing promptly at four o'clock. Oh. If you have items to check out, please do so now. Internet terminals will shut down at 355. Thank you. Yeah, I was, I was gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to, um, oh, hit pause because I I'm I I, I, I went past the two hours. And the other thing but is, I'm, they're trying to fill 24 hours. Yep. Where when, when we grew up, there was 15 hours of news with Walter yep. Cronkite, and then we went to a half an hour of news with Walter Cronkite. Right. Yep. My contention is we still have 15 or 30 minutes of news that we hear 24 <laughs> hours a day. Right. Right. You know, right. <laughs> which is where I right. think the right. cat which videos ought to come in. But sometimes we try to squeeze another hour of Russia or another hour of the Democratic right. Convention or something, yeah. Right. But you know, if, you, just, if you have values, if you know your values, you stand for something or you'll fall for anything. So if you know your you. values, you know what you're looking for. Yes, absolutely. Thank you all so much for coming.